Good morning and happy Tuesday, 10 at 10. I am your host and bakery influencer, Richard Charpentier. And every Tuesday, we meet to answer questions sent from you, the bakers, uh, within this segment, we're trying to answer as many questions as we can. And if we have, if you have not done it yet, please subscribe to the Bakerpedia page. It's free to join with lots of great educational free resources to help you on your day-to-day -day activities. So let's get started with our first question today. Uh, someone wants to know what additives are available for cookies that can inhibit mold and yeast growth in finished product? That's a great question. So my personal opinion is adding things to products, you have to also understand why you need to add it. So before adding anything, the question to you would be, what is the water activity and pH of your finished cookies? Why does that matter? Because then it allows you and me to better understand what to add. For example, most cookies have a water activity. I'll give you a range from 0 0.5 to maybe 0 0.7 based on the changes in the variation of your formulation. Why is this important? Because if you get to a 0 0.6 and lower, there's no mold growth or pathogenic issues that you have with your cookies. So at that point, that low of a level, you I would almost not add anything because molds and yeast are present in the air. When you bake your cookies, your cookies are coming out from the oven to be completely sterile is what happens from the time they get out of the oven to the time they're getting packaged that you have risk of mold. So I'm of the school of thought that add, adding is just a band-aid. Let's figure out where the real issue and how to better, you know, not add any products. In the case where you would need to add products, you know, sorbic acid, a potassium sorbate might be one that could help you. Uh, and again, with cookies, in order to be effective, your pH has to be within the 5.5 to 6. If not, if you have a sort of neutral pH around 7, it's quite ineffective and therefore, again, wasting money. But in order to control molds and yeast, it's better off with a good sanitation program and check your water activity and check where your pH of the finished product is. And then let's determine a program of how you can prevent it. So that's my opinion, you know, and I think that would be the best approach I would give to you, but that's what I offer. So hopefully it works out for you. Good luck with it. Thank you for sending your question. Now for next question, uh, some they're having some cross crumb separation. Do you think it is because it gets too dry? The crumb over or however is not very very dry. Often it's created when you there. There's many factors, and it's the questions we've already gone through in previous uh, sessions. Where you know if you underproofed, underhydrated, undermixed, there's many factors that would create it, a proof box, the temperature. So it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly is your problem. And and I, my recommendation at this point is save yourself you know, time and go to Bakerpedia and Bakery Resources and get a consultant, even 30 minutes. There'll be money well invested where you pinpoint your answer, you know, you get, you get your answer based exactly on your formulation and your process. Most of the time, you know, cross separation, I, I could I could say it's because of this or because of that, but not knowing exactly your process or your bakery 
will be very challenging to just give you, you know, the, the cure. It's almost going to the doctor's office, right? You, you, the doctor will ask you, what are the symptoms? What have you been eating? Are you drinking? Are you exercising? And then they say, therefore say, okay, you should take this same principle here. You know, it's easier if I get a little more information. So if you resend your question, if you don't want to do the consulting, give a little more information. So it's easier for me to, you know, guide you and and give you the best, you know, answer for your question. But thank you, though. And now for our next question, we have someone asking. They're making a sandwich bread with a closed pan, also referred to as Pullman bread with a lid that slides on top. What temperature would be recommended in the east oven? We see breads drying fast and also cracks on the surface. So it appears that, you know, if you see cracks, I always go back to the first thing in my mind, you know, the in, in referring to the crack, we'll get to the temperature. The cracks could be the pen to dough ratio. You know, do you have the proper amount of dough for the size of the pen? Because if it gets too big, then it'll tend to expand and it could crack. So that's one issue, could be under hydrated. And as far as the right temperature to bake it, usually 400 Fahrenheit uh, uh, would be ideal because you have a pan to 425, again, not knowing what oven are you using, straight conduction, conduction, convection, you know, it, it, it's difficult to just say that, but within that range. And the most important thing that you need to measure is check your breads when you think it's done and put a thermometer towards the center. Where are you in terms of temperature? You wanna get to around 200 degrees, uh, right around 200 degrees, maybe plus or minus five from, you know, let's say 195 to, to uh, uh, 205. And when you're in a pan, you have to account, it's better to be a little lower because the bread will be sitting in the pan for a little longer. So therefore you're continuing the baking process as the metal is still conducting heat. So if you're leaving it too long, you're one baking it too much, and then leaving it too long in your pan, you might dry off a lot of the moisture after it comes out for the next 15 minutes after coming out. And that, that's not recommended. And it could be, you know, for the flow of the bread within the pan, I recommend, you know, again, go back to are you properly, uh, you have the proper water absorption level? Are you mixing correctly? Do you have the right flour, et cetera? But there is no rule of thumb as long as, you know, you, usually you don't want to, you know, what's it's conduction with a pan and the lid, you know, the heat has to go through the metal and then through the size of the bread and to go to the center of your bread. So it's a lot to overcome. And hopefully, you know, you it, it resolves your problem. But thank you for sending your question. Now for our next question, uh, someone wants to know how many grams of sodium benzoid to you to use to preserve commercial breads for two weeks. Well, again, it's a broad question. I'm not a believer that just put something in and solve the problem, and it's you can walk away. Remember, preserving breads is shelf life of bread has two things: is starch retrogradation. That means staling process. That means your bread is getting stale and dry. There's that to prevent. And second, you have to prevent any potential molds and molds as stated in the first question come from the bakery. You bake it, your bread is sterile as what do you do from that point to cool it and handle it in packaging that will create potential mold problem. So it's good sanitation program. Sodium benzoid does not is not my favorite to use for bread product. One, it functions much better at lower pHs around 4.5. So if you're getting on the bread, traditional, you know, straight dough, you're going to get to the 5.4, 5.6. So it might not work well. And the issue you're seeing with sodium benzoid is the water activity of a bread is much too high to use to get efficacy of your sodium benzoid. So I will lean more towards a calcium propionate. Propionic acid will be more suited for bread. 
or else you can uh, get you know fermented wheat and fermented corn product which are of lowering you know more clean label level and those are better to help with bread so go ask a lot of different vendors and greening vendors have wonderful clean label solutions today other than sodium benzoids uh, which might not be my favorite choice for your question so but best of luck and remember you have access to bakery consultant where you can hire someone for 30 minutes if needed to to support you with your question so and now today for our last question of the day someone wants to know on straight dough what is the right time to add yeast during straight dough mixing <laughs> and the right time to add yeast on the straight dough system, remember a yeast, you know, depending on the type of yeast you're using, you could be using a cream yeast. You could use crumble yeast, which is the fresh, comes in the blocks. You could be using dry instant or dry active. So it's about reactivity of the yeast. And when it's in the liquid form, it's right away active. It's already dormant. It's kept at the right, you know, temp cool temperature to keep it dormant. And once you put it into your bread dough, it's activated. It, 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 I would say put it up front because you want enough time to activate the yeast while it's properly developing during the mixing process. I would put it early on, but again. I re-emphasize re the sort of the question that I was asking, what type of yeast are you using? Because that will play a, a, a factor, an important factor is when you edit it. And again, if your line, how you set up, is this a high speed throughput line or are you more manual? All of those questions are very important in implementing a process or best practices for a bakery so that was it so that's it for today thank you very much for listening to tuesday 10 at 10 i'm your host richard sharpenshire so until next week and happy baking thank you